Good morning folks and I welcome you to the Tennessee River. We're just on the outskirts of Chattanooga and Norfolk Southern Debutts Yard. This here is just about the beginning or the bottom of the Norfolk Southern CNO and TP Main from Chattanooga up to the Northeast through Kentucky and I think into Ohio as well. So I'm up here to visit some family this summer. So we're gonna have plenty of time to get out here and try and see some trains over the next week or so. Also have some friends coming up, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I've never been here before, this is a new line for me, but there's all sorts of different opportunity here. So just had two trains meet on the bridge and for day one, that's a pretty good start. So let's get rolling here. With day one starting at about nine o'clock a.m., there would be no shortage of trains over the next couple of weeks. A southbound mixed freight to Chattanooga was already coming across the bridge within moments of me ending that recent introduction. Norfolk Southern's Debutts Yard down in Chattanooga handles the majority of rail traffic headed to the northeast, west, and southeast United States. And the former Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Texas Pacific Railroad headed north to Cincinnati, Ohio would have no shortage of north and southbound rail traffic. We'd be focusing on the southern CNO and TP, so we'd start at the bottom and make our way north. Starting here at the giant double track bridge span for the Tennessee River. Like some places that I'm familiar with back in my home territory, the Tennessee River also has a public river walk, which is what we'd utilize to set up for our first few trains of the day. Located just upon the northeastern outskirts of Chattanooga, the bridge across the Tennessee River sits just in front of the Chickamauga Dam, one of Tennessee's hydroelectric power plants, the first hydroelectric facility I've ever seen. But it is a great use for this very impressive and very scenic river that stretches about 1,800 feet from side to side where we are, at least for the railroad bridge, and has a pretty consistent flow of water all the time. The dam also appears to be a pretty big hotspot for local fishermen attempting to catch fish coming out of the gates. With the connection to the Atlanta North District just to our south, the CNO and TP is double tracked out of Chattanooga up to Control Point Hickson, which is where after these first two trains across the river is where we'd go next. Three miles north on the line and we're in Hickson, Tennessee. Parked upon the side of Adams Road, right here at the grade crossing of Old Hickson Pike, is the railroad's control point named Hickson. This is where the double track that comes up out of Chattanooga singles up going north, set up right across the road from the old-fashioned Chatterbug Furniture Store. The wait would only be a few minutes for our first northbound train I heard coming up out of Chattanooga, Norfolk Southern Manifest Freight number 168. Sporting a couple of foreign visitors taken off of the previous day's 25A, 168 is daily manifest freight from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Madison, Illinois. And as we'll come to find out today and later on in this trip, the CNO and TP tends to get a lot of foreign visitors. Not sure what's been afoot at the Norfolk Southern Power Desk this year, but even reports from local rail fans mention that foreign power on this line has been ubiquitous for almost all of 2022. A fairly short train that 168 would be pulling today, but once his bottom end got by Hickson, we heard of yet another northbound train coming up out of Chattanooga. I decided to move a little bit north on the line to catch it. At the Lower Mill Road Crossing, there's a few notable things. A pretty sharp curve through the woods, an intermediate signal, and the Hickson defect detector. As soon as we arrived, the intermediate signal showed a high green, full speed ahead, although this wouldn't necessarily tell you everywhere that a train is coming. From what I've heard, the intermediate signals on Norfolk Southern in this area can line for a train on the way up to four signal blocks away. However, when there are no trains around, the signals will default to one aspect or another. So seeing an aspect on one of these other than red doesn't necessarily mean that a train is coming, but I knew one was. Only a few more minutes passed before the positive red lights began flashing and Norfolk Southern Train 142 showed up from around the bend.
142 is daily manifest freight from Chattanooga to Elkhart, Indiana. A lot of coiled steel and gondolas on this one, and two more foreign Union Pacific visitors. Southern, milepost 327.1, no defects. With 142 clear of Hickson with no defects, we would follow him up the line northbound as we heard that he was about to meet a southbound train in the double track starting at Cave Springs and ending at the control point of Daisy, likely named for the town of Saudi Daisy that the tracks are in. Dispatch would stick 142 in the hole on main 1, while our southbound would be to run around them on track 2. This diverging clear indication at Daisy would diverge our southbound onto track 2 and around the 142. The wait was only about 15 minutes before our southbound train rolled up on Daisy. The southbound train would be NS-143, the sister southbound as I call it to 142, although this train coming from Alcard, Indiana runs all the way to Macon, Georgia, likely with a drop off in Chattanooga along the way. A lot of grain, tank cars and potash on this one, and serving as double DPU duty would be one of Norfolk Southern's SD-70 ACC's and a BNSF GE. As we'll also come to see, every now and then we'll get something else, but BNSF and Union Pacific tend to be the most common foreign visitors along the CNO and TP. Likely because many of the trains that run the CNO and TP run to or from interchanges with those railroads. With 143 off the main on number 2, 142 could once again take off northward. Nothing else on the immediate radar, we'd hang here at Daisy for a couple more hours, and just like that, out of nowhere, a northbound train would almost sneak up on me, with the only warning of its presence coming from the sound of a classic Nathan P5 blaring across the city streets. Making it to us just after 3 p.m., the mystery northbound would turn out to be NS-196, a daily manifest freight from Chattanooga up to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Perhaps some locomotive overkill, these guys would have a pretty easy run up the CNO and TP as well, with a fairly short train being pulled with three six-axle motors. This shorty train, though, would conclude our action here in Daisy with nothing else on the radar and me having seen enough trains here so we'd hit the road northbound right behind the 196 just to see how far north we could make it before anything else came up. We were actually catching up to the rear end of 196 when we heard them going into the siding at Dayton. This indicated that there could potentially be a southbound train coming for them to meet there, so we'd stop off 27 at downtown Dayton just to see what would happen. We could see the rear end of 196 sitting at the north end of the siding, and a very curious set of gas prices just across the tracks at the B&E convenience store. These were some of the lowest I'd seen almost anywhere at the time of this recording, especially compared to my home state, Florida. 
The stop in at Dayton would also include a high green at the signal bridge for the south end of Dayton siding, which confirmed my prior suspicions. And only a couple minutes later, around the corner, came our headlight. Solid auto racks being led by a solo AC44 C6M rebuild with another one somewhere in the middle. Southbound would turn out to be NS-189, a daily manifest freight running from Detroit, Michigan down to East Point, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. 189 almost always runs with this kind of engine setup, with one at the front and another one either in the middle or on the rear. And to my knowledge, they usually drop their mixed freight portion up at Harriman or Emory Gap, leaving them with nothing but auto racks the rest of the way to Atlanta. Either that, or they'll make a pickup in Chattanooga, which they'll take to East Point also, although I'm not sure about that. Anyhow, with 189 down south of us now, we continue north following the 196 close behind, with them taking off from Dayton. But just before we take off, I guess I'll make it known that if you need a new vacuum cleaner, make your way to Dayton. Up 27, we continue to roll up until Spring City, Tennessee. This will, throughout this video, be one of the most namesake towns that we'll revisit, but we wouldn't be stopping in there quite yet. Because our southbound train of the day was sitting between the switches at Spring City, waiting for that NS-196 to get north of them. Having heard about this one through the CNO and TP Facebook group a few days before, the southbounder of the day would be Norfolk Southern 179. And just after the very short 196 cleared the south end of Spring City, they took off southbound with a very interesting power set. On a multi-day southbound run from Bellevue, Ohio, 179 is daily manifest freight for Irondale, Alabama. He works a multitude of yards along his way, which is why the heads up for this guy came so many days in advance. That along with crew shortages and whatnot can make for a plethora of delays. But nothing we're not used to from the Sunshine State. Today's 179 would be hosting a very intriguing set of engines, with the leader being one of Union Pacific's AC-46s. These are interesting locomotives that Union Pacific has on their roster. They're basically car bodies of AC 6000s, but with the internals of an AC 4400. I believe that the story behind those is that when Union Pacific ordered the engines, they ordered them without the higher horsepower motor. And after some time passed, they ended up just putting one of the more common 4000 horsepower engines inside the body. Even so, a very interesting locomotive build, especially paired with the trailing engine, BNSF 642, a GE-9 wide cab build, but still wearing the old Santa Fe war bonnet paint scheme. Simply consider here that the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe merged to create BNSF in 1995, so at least since then, this locomotive has survived on class one rails with this paint scheme. And just as the little cherry on top, right in the middle as mid-train DP, we have BNSF 1104. Another GE-9, but wearing BNSF's first ever paint scheme, Heritage 1, or H1 for short. These three locomotives assigned to pull this train to Irondale would be quite the draw for rail fans in central Tennessee. I'd even see a few trackside along my run from here back down to Saudi Daisy a neighborhood crossing that I had discovered on Google Maps just a few hours beforehand at Hot Water Road. Dayton's traffic congestion would make this a close one, but just barely, we made it.
with 179 off and running, it was now back to Spring City. Here we'd spend the rest of the evening for our first day, as there's a bit of an afternoon rush that happens on the CNO and TP between about three to four trains that are usually daily runners. For most days that we're out here, Spring City will be our evening chill spot, with City Hall right across the street, in a nice downtown region, Spring City would be a nice area to spend the evenings, especially with the old depot that still stands here, as there's a bit of space behind the building to stake out while you wait for your trains, and the Spring City folks did a good job with these fences. Fences can often pose challenges for photographers and videographers alike around railroad tracks, but in this case they built them fairly well. They're just high enough to keep the little ones off the tracks, but just low enough so that the majority of camera equipment and tripods can accommodate the height. At least for me, they'd be no problem. The evening rush came up pretty quickly. Within a few minutes of our arrival, and meet up with a couple of local rail fans, NS215 was calling signals north of us, and was thundering by the old depot in minutes. Fifteen is a daily Chicago, Illinois to Atlanta, Georgia intermodal train that almost daily carries miscellaneous freight at the head. Technically, 215 falls under the intermodal group of trains on Norfolk Southern, but figuratively you could see this as one giant manifest freight, as he's got the miscellaneous at the head and then these intermodal containers following it up. These containers can carry just as much a variety of things as the miscellaneous stuff before them, although the intermodal containers would be carrying more commercial goods, like something you'd order on Amazon or eBay, household appliances or electronics, while the manifest freight at the front and their trains alike would fall more under the industrial goods category, such as lumber, liquids, and more of stuff for companies, industries, and manufacturers that would have specifically put in an order for this stuff and that will have close to direct access to a rail delivery off a spur or sidetrack. After deciding to move for the next train at the last second, we'd all scurry down to the Piccadilly Avenue road crossing just south of the depot and just barely get our stuff turned on in time for Norfolk Southern 229. A train that I'm more familiar with, a daily intermodal train from Chicago, Illinois bound for the Jacksonville, Florida interchange to the Florida East Coast Railway. Every now and then I'll see this train on a Folkestone trip or something similar, but now I'm actually on the NS line that they run all the way down, so I'll get to see this guy almost every day. With loads of UPS and other high priority container traffic, 229 trumps almost every other train over the CNO and TP, with some trains waiting hours just to keep this one moving. At least in the days I was here, I heard it happen a few times. They actually sidelined our next train up near Harriman for 229, which would push its arrival to almost sunset. What train would that be? Oh, I don't know. It was an Norfolk Southern grain train of some kind or another. I've heard that the CNO and TP gets a lot of these, and I can attest after being in Tennessee that they do. But the one thing that they all have in common is that if you don't hear them on the radio, it's almost impossible to find out what they are. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. If you rail fan this line a lot and know what runs up and down it, you might have an idea of what these symbols are just by looking at a train. But I, somebody from two states south away, have no clue. Because from my experiences with them, Norfolk Southern grain trains have only specified originations and not destinations. So unless you hear what train it is, it's almost impossible to find out where it's coming from or where it's going. 
I've also experienced hearing the symbol for one of these grainers over the radio, then looking it up on the internet only to find out that its routing didn't line up whatsoever with the territory that it was passing through. So my conclusion there is simply that grain trains are weird. So as long as I've recorded the thing and it's on my SD card, it's not too much of a concern to me beyond that. This would, however, be our last train for day one. The sun was setting quickly now and we had a home to be to, so we'd hit the road for there. But tomorrow was another day. So much for our gradual northward progression, the next day would ironically bring us to one of the most northern points on the line that we would visit on this trip, walking down the rugged trails to present day Tunnel 24 in the rural town of Nemo, Tennessee. Nemo is known as one of the most remote points along the CNO and TP, and it's where the majority of all the tunnels are along this line that gave the line the nickname back in the day, the Rat Hole. Our failures to find the trailhead up to Tunnel 23 found us walking down the trails to 24. Northbound Manifest Freight number 196 would be rounding the curves into the tunnel as we arrived. But this is the CNO and TP, so we knew that there would be something again fairly soon. And especially after making the heck of a trek down here, we were not about to half-ass our wait. During the aforementioned wait, though, we'd move over and investigate the old Tunnel 24 that was the original structure through this mountain before the upgraded structure was built by the Southern Railway. This old structure, born in 1878, was what took the original CNO and TP through the mountains at Nemo. This tunnel, though, along with three or four others, had to be upgraded in the 1960s by the Southern with increasing train heights and lengths. And although the ties and rails are long gone, the original tunnel bore is still here. And aforementioned ATV enthusiasts often use this as a pathway through the mountain, and also as a path to the aforementioned Tunnel 23. Although, as you may be able to tell though, this is flooded beyond comprehension. And with both the season and terrain of land that we're in, this is the way that this tunnel is, almost all summer long. The only time of year that this tunnel might be traversable on foot is in the winter months when the moisture and precipitation are at their yearly low. Otherwise, at least for us, with my pair of vans on my feet and a couple of other sneakers that my friends had on, there was no way that we were going to make it through this thing on foot or with the cars that we had with us. We would find our way up to Tunnel 23 later today, but for now, we had to settle with 24, which was by no means a bad spot. I'll also make the comment here that personally I found it incredible how much cooler the air was between these two sets of land between the bore for this tunnel. In any case, our relief from the humidity and sightseeing was cut short as Norfolk Southern trains were coming up over the radio calling CW Tower, which is just north of Tunnel 23, indicating that southbounds were on the way. We'd set up across the tracks on a couple of stones covered in shale, for what, if my memory's recalling correctly, was NS Southbound 25A. With the Canadian Pacific foreign visitor trailing third this morning, 25A is an interesting train that runs the CNO and TP. This is a similar situation to NS215 that we saw in Spring City the day before, but in this case it's kind of the opposite. Out of his origination at Chicago, Illinois, he'll run with both commercial and industrial manifest freight, manifest and intermodal, down to either Danville, Illinois or Cincinnati, Ohio, where they drop off the intermodal containers and then run to Chattanooga with all of the industrial manifest freight portion. 25A is one of the most common trains to hold foreign power on this line considering it's Chicago origination, but some days are exceptions, but not so much today. We stuck our ground on the rocks as another southbound train was knocking down signals just behind the 25A. I was able to get the drone up for this one, but we weren't able to catch the symbol on him. He was either 23G or 223. Both of these trains we'll see later on in this trip, so I'll save the originations and destinations for later. Flying the drone above this mixed intermodal and auto rack train was quite the activity down here in Nemo. With the practically see-through well cars, it's really interesting from up above to see the track flying under below. And through my phone screen, the drone's view would be the most entertainment I'd get out of my phone down here in Nemo, as if I haven't mentioned it yet, Nemo is one of the most remote points along the CNO and TP, and there is not a chance of getting cell service down here. And the deeper you go, the worse it gets. 
So the satellite and Wi-Fi connection between my phone and the drone would make for my only entertainment through the phone screen as the train flew by. Though they've already made a couple of unintended cameos, I'd be real fanning today in Nemo with my friends Peyton Cross and his friend Ethan out of Kentucky. They'd be my entertainment mentors and local guides for the day, although I say guides pretty loosely, as we kind of figured a lot of this out along the way together today. Nemo was a pretty new thing for all of us, and we'd set up across the track to Tunnel 24 for one last southbound of the morning, NS215, a lot earlier than yesterday's train, so early that I'd consider this out of his normal time slot by a lot. After the last car of 2.15, we made the 20 minute trek back up to the car at Catoosa Road. And since Nemo's just on the outskirts of Wartburg, Tennessee, we drove about 15 minutes into the cell service town to catch up on whatever we may have missed and to get some lunch. While we were in town with cell service, we got in touch with somebody who knew a little more about the area than we did, so we could come right back after lunch to give another attempt towards Tunnel 23. All right, well, a couple hours later now, and we're at the Made it back to the trail head. Down there is where we went before. Catoosa Road. Down there across the Emory River. And now we get to go down to the Emory River Bridge. Hey. Welcome to the uh, trail that is unmarked and treacherous. Welcome to your worst nightmare. This is Peyton Cross and that's a rock. <laughs> so. Long story short, this morning we took a whole nother trail down there that didn't lead anywhere. And now we're up here and this one's so much better. Look at this. Now you even gotta include that <laughs> show over there. <laughs> not, nope, nope, that's not gonna go in. This is one rock and then what? Then what, genius? Then what? Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now what? Now <laughs> what? Well, right there it is down there. <laughs> yeah, I found it. Well, all right, just a little bit of a ways later, and now we've got the other end of the uh, the old Tunnel 24, I believe, on the north side, and it's still just as wet over here. And we came from that away. The old track would have been here at one time, but the ATV guys have uh, since taken over, and uh, two of my people are down there. I don't know what they're doing. What are y'all making out in there? Let's go. <laughs> Following the old right of way, the trails would bring us back up to the present day tracks and as we continued down, 22A would sneak up behind us coming north. 22A is a daily intermodal and auto rack combo running out of Norfolk, Virginia on a northbound run for Louisville, Kentucky. He just beat us up to the Emory River Bridge that accompanies Tunnel 23 on the north side. We'd finally make it down to the bridge just as his last few cars cleared the scene. And within another 10 minutes we had another southbound train calling signals just north of our tunnel at CW Tower. That along with some screeching rails would be our only warning of our mystery southbound coming across. Yep, mystery train is the best that this one's gonna get because we couldn't make out the symbol nor could we tell who he was by looking at him. With a solo locomotive on the front and no other locomotives anywhere in the train, this would make for one engine pulling a decent sized manifest, which we had no idea who we could pin that on. Though he'd be lacking any other engines or distinction points anywhere in his train, seeing the actual consist rolling across this bridge is still an amazing sight for me. 
This giant railroad bridge accompanied by the tunnel on the other side makes for one of the most unique railroad photography opportunities around. This spot, however, is only accessible by those completely determined. It took a mile and a half of on-foot hiking through jagged, unmarked, unstable, and damp terrain under the Tennessee humidity to reach this spot, all the while, as aforementioned, having zero cell service whatsoever. Other than the common sense part, this is still one of those areas that you simply have to be careful because if something happens back here, there's almost no way to contact anyone. But our determination and alertness got us all there in our respective pieces. Though not everybody can say the same. Back around March of 2022, some guy managed to get his old 1960s GMC pickup hit by a train back here just across the bridge where we are. And I'm not sure how much of this next bit is true, but there are rumors that this guy is now trying to sue Norfolk Southern for the damages on account of inadequate signage. Something that is ridiculous to me, considering just how rural and inaccessible this place is. I really don't think that anyone with common sense would need a sign to know that Norfolk Southern or some big railroad owns this property. Rumors are also that Norfolk Southern may potentially want to limit access to the spot in the future due to this. Although, personally, I don't see that happening because for those who are completely determined, they'll still find ways down here. And the lawsuit is so odd with such an invalid basis that it will likely just get thrown out in the end. But we had a bit of common sense up in our heads, so we wouldn't have any problems back here for the three and a half hours that we'd sit here waiting on trains. And ironically enough, we wouldn't see another train until almost the very end of our wait. A southbound Norfolk Southern 189. On a run southbound from Detroit, Michigan, 189 is the same auto rack train that we saw in downtown Dayton yesterday. Although in this scenario, he's still north of Harriman and Emory Gap, so he still has the mixed freight portion on the head of his train. This bottom auto rack portion is what will stay with the train beyond Harriman all the way to Atlanta and East Point. Traffic had obviously slowed down because for the three and a half hours that we were by these tracks, the only trains that we'd see was that 22A, the Mystery Southbound, and this 189. We could have stayed longer, but Peyton had to make his way back to Kentucky around this time, so we figured we'd all leave and make the hike back to the car together. And I definitely can't complain too much, because I did get shots back here at all, considering the fact that I hadn't planned on getting any here. But now that I did, I am very glad that I did because it is quite the opportunity to see scenes like this with trains right in the middle. There's only so many spots in America quite like this. One final drone chase of 189 aside the Emory River as they turn the corner and enter present day Tunnel 24. The old Tunnel 24 that we had passed on our way here is off to the right about 30 degrees. With 189 clearing the scene, we'd be on our way, and so would Peyton, so we'd say goodbye to him and his friend, and we'd make our way back to Spring City for the evening rush. Well, needless to say, today's been a very interesting day thus far. Didn't really plan on going to Nemo this morning, but with a couple of my friends coming down, we made the, uh, the time to go and do that, but came back down to Spring City, because that's where we ended off yesterday, and over the next few days, we'll be focusing north of here up to Harriman and possibly up to Oakdale. We'll get to that when it comes up, but as of now, we've got uh, northbound coming up who's going to have to go in the siding for one, if not possibly two southbound trains. So we've come to Spring City to kind of take advantage of that today. And uh, on the way here, I did see that there was a BNSF coal train coming out of the TVA plant in Kingston, empty. And those trains go back to the BNSF interchange over in Memphis, Tennessee. So to go back that way, it's actually an interesting move. They have to Y the train throughout downtown Harriman. Maybe that's something we'll see up there in the next couple days, but that uh, might come this evening as well. So we'll see what happens. Also, I'm uh, quite beat with all the hiking we had to do today over there in Nemo, but it was definitely an interesting experience, so.
first in line was Combo Train 215, which is kind of ironic considering that we saw one in Nemo this morning, which means there could have been two of these, or one could have been late from another day. And considering the CNO and T's position along many trains' routings at this point, it's not too far out of the realm of possibility that this could have been another day's 215. Or perhaps the case could have been such for the one this morning. As 215 clears, it reveals NS-170 in the siding at Spring City. 170 is a daily Chattanooga, Tennessee to Conway, Pennsylvania manifest. They'd be stuck in the hole here for plenty of southbounds. One such being like this grain train. Another symbolless, unidentified train of grain headed south for somewhere. I have no clue where. But wherever it is, they want it there quickly, it seems. Go figure, it's after we leave our famous spot at Nemo, but the CNO and TP has got freight to move. The next in line, 189. The same 189 that we saw up at Nemo for our last train. His stop around Harriman or Emory Gap to drop off the mixed freight cut would allow us to beat him back to Spring City. Such also explains why the mixed freight is now gone, and the only remainder is the auto racks. But the same two engines on the top and bottom gave this one away. One eighty nine calls an approach signal at the south end of Spring City because that is how close he is to the rear markers of that grain train. So close that the dispatcher can only line one or two signal blocks ahead of them before they'd reach the bottom end of that grainer. And the list would only get longer. Another southbound was right on the markers of eighty nine, too. And this one's priority would trump everyone. Two twenty nine, Jacksonville's intermodal various UPS and container traffic bound for Florida's east coast. Finally, after holding at the hands of dispatch for everybody else, NS-170, manifest for Conway, Pennsylvania, finally gets the diverging clear to move out of Spring City and to the next siding up.
Ironically enough, though, these guys had sat in the siding for so long that they'd have to tie the train down at Roddy, the next siding ahead, as their crew was just about out of time. We still had a couple of hours to spend trackside, though, and within that time, we'd get a high grain at the Spring City Depot for a northbound. And up from the south shortly came the first iteration of what will become a fairly big focus in the next few videos, a Kingston Coal Train, 72Z, sporting, not surprisingly, some BNSF power. The 72Z is foreign run-through coal off the BNSF Railway through their interchange at Memphis, Tennessee, through Chattanooga, and up the CNO and TP to the Kingston Power Plant, such as just on the southern outskirts of Harriman. All of this run-through coal comes from BNSF's giant Powder River Basin, and there's almost one of these trains every single day bound for the Kingston plant running on here. BNSF also most commonly runs these trains with distributed power, usually two front, one rear. And today's rear would be an interesting one, one of BNSF's 50th anniversary Jeevos wearing a plethora of predecessor decals. It was around this time that we were going to start making the trek back to the house. But because of the way that the Tennessean geography is set up, we'd have to go a bit north to the Interstate 40 on-ramp so we could go north towards Crossville. And just before getting on the interstate, we'd hear a couple of things that would stop us along the way, just before the on-ramp, NS-188 was coming up behind us with a train of empty auto racks. 188 is the sister northbound to 189 from yesterday and today, and so it works pretty much the same, just in reverse. On a return trip from East Point, he's pretty much all auto racks. But coming up here around Emory Gap or a little north at Harriman, he'll probably pick up some empty mixed freight to go north with the rest of the train. South of such, though, he's all auto carriers. And we stopped off here at Emory Gap because just north of us, there's a switch called EG Tower. Norfolk Southern, mile post, 261.9, no defects. And it was pretty much at this switch that the dispatcher had set a meet between this train and 73Z. 73Z, clear McCoy. 73Z is the sister southbound to 72Z that we just saw back at Spring City. Having fully unloaded at the Kingston plant, 73Z is taking these empty coal hoppers back to Memphis to where the BNSF will take them back north to the Powder River Basin and load it again. 73Z, clear EG Tower. With some more very unique BNSF power, this would be a nice end to day number two. Some orange engines would end our day under an orange sky. This'll be all for video number one. Hopefully fairly soon I'll have some more of this done, but until then, I'll see you somewhere next time on the Volunteer State Rails.